أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم أصبر الله ونعم الوكيل نعم المولى ونعم النسير ثم الصلاة والسلام والتحية والإكرام على رسوله والنبينا أبو القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين روحي وأرواه العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء ولعنة الله على عدائهم أجمعين من الأولين والآخرين آمين يا رب العالمين أما بعد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا إن جاءكم فاسق بنبأ فتبينوا فتبينوا أن تصيبوا قوما بجهالة فتصبحوا على ما فعلتم نادمين وإذا قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هل ننبئكم بالأخسرين أعمالا الذين ظل سعيهم في الحياة الدنيا وهم يحسب هم يحسبون أنهم يحسنون صنعا صدق الله العلي العظيم السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته So finally as a few people have said to me uh, we've gotten to a stage where we can look at an actual example of how someone frees their mind, how someone performs their duties successfully and does it while maintaining that connection with the na'ib of the imam of his time and ensuring that whatever he is doing is in sync with or permitted by what the imam and of course through the na'ib of the imam allows and as a result within Islam. Now like I said um, over the past few days, I'm not going to do a traditional Muhtar Nama where we sit down and we discuss in great, great detail the actual historical event of what happened with Muhtar. Alhamdulillah, Islamic Republic of Iran has created a wonderful series, nearly 40 parts I believe, uh, which discusses this and shows this in great detail. There's no need for me to just repeat that. Rather, what we're going to do is we're going to analyze uh, certain events that took place with Muqtar and how he reacted. Events that have similes in our time. And this will give us an understanding of how important it is to first understand what the enemy is doing. Understand when you have to make an alliance with someone who you may not agree with. And understand why you have to always, always, always retain that connection of Allah. As in what happens if you confuse this connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, as I'm sure everyone here is aware... Mukhtar ibn Abi Ubaidah al-Thaqafi was someone who is famous for having taken revenge on the killers of Imam Hussain. Yani this was the first or the small revenge, if you like, where he physically, um, following Ashura, and there's a whole lot of history which we will discuss in, like I said, in some, not detail, but we'll discuss it a little bit. He made sure to find many of the senior elites who worked to and who conspired with Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, who worked for Yazid, who were deluded by Yazid actually, into committing this atrocity in Karbala on Ashura, which is the reason why we're gathered here for these 10 days. But before we speak about all of that, we have to understand that. Until not too long ago, in the mainstream Shia community, I don't mean within the Hausa or within the seminaries or within the people who actually knew. I'm talking about in the, gen- in the general Shia community. There was a lot of propaganda against Muqdar. Very serious propaganda. Propaganda that declared him a heretic. Propaganda that said that he was after his own kingdom, if you like. Propaganda that suggested 
he was just using Ahlul Bayt. And so before we proceed fully into the whole discussion, we want to, first of all, understand this propaganda, because, of course, this is the underlying subject of what we're discussing. So we want to understand this propaganda, and we want to then, through the course of today and more than likely tomorrow, determine why this propaganda is invalid. So one of the elements of propaganda that was laid against Mukhtar is that he was someone who worshipped Muhammad bin Hanafiya. Who was Muhammad bin Hanafiya? Muhammad bin Hanafiya was the half brother of Imam Hussein. According to many riwayat, according to all the riwayat, he didn't go to Karbala because he was injured. He had uh, say he they say he had a limp. According to some. Uh, some historians, they say that he had polio. It doesn't really matter why he had a limp or he couldn't use one of his legs or both of his legs. What matters is he didn't go to Karbala. Imam Hussein knew about this. Imam Hussein did not blame him. And in fact, Imam Hussein gave him a lot of responsibility going forward. Even though Muhammad bin Hanafi was one of the people who asked Imam Hussein that, are you, are you sure about this? Is this really something you want to do? When uh, Imam Hussein was moving out from Medina to Mecca and then obviously from Mecca through to. And Imam Hussein had many discussions with him and explained to him the gravity of the situation. And Muhammad bin Hanafi, this is someone who was raised by Amir al-Mu'mineen. He was not the son of Fatima al-Zahra, alayha, but he was raised by Amir al-Mu'mineen. And he was raised alongside Imam Hussain, uh, Imam al-Hassan, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, etc., etc. Said Zainab, all of these people were his brothers and sisters, essentially. So he was someone who really did understand things a lot better than, say, you and me. He was following Karbala, after the event of Karbala, Muhammad bin Hanafiya was with Imam Sajjad. When Imam Sajjad got to Mecca, after the event and after the Arba'een, uh, when the Sabaya came back to Medina, and then from Medina it was safer for Imam Sajjad to be in Mecca. And Muhammad bin Hanafiya also moved to Mecca to be with the Imam and to act as his uh, representative, as per Imam Sajjad's instructions. Why is this even relevant? Why am I saying this? Because the situation in Mecca at that time was very dire. Think about the situation in your countries. If anyone here is from Iran, okay, you're in a different situation. But think about the situation in the non-Muslim countries. And you will see that constantly there is propaganda. There is everything is always on a knife edge. You know, then you you never know. The next time you switch the TV on in the morning when you're having breakfast, you know, you have some news coming out saying Muslim terrorist does blah blah blah. It doesn't matter if it's true or false. Doesn't I'm not looking at the true the veracity of these type of news is. I'm saying that this is what happens. This is a normal thing. Every day when I get up in the morning. In fact, when I get up for Fajr, after Fajr, I will look at my phone to see what the news is. And almost always there is either Gaza has been bombed, which has been happening since the beginning of this month and even before, every day. And unfortunately, Muslim centers are not saying anything about it, including many Sunni ones, sadly. Shias are not saying anything. Sunnis are not saying anything. No one is really interested in the poor people of Gaza who have no electricity or anything. But I'm not going to digress. You have propaganda against you. You switch on the news, you see uh, it, thoughts and concepts being promoted that are against you, that are against Islam. You have many, many strange ideas floating around. Maybe in your WhatsApp, you will get a, you know, a set of videos sent which are problematic. How are they problematic? Let's say I've heard recently that there are Sisters, our own sisters, who are making videos of nohe, uh, latmiyat, um, lamentations, and putting them on the YouTubes. And they're the ones singing, Habibi, this is not allowed. This is a problem Islamically from a fiqhi point of view. 
If it's only within a sister's or a sister's gathering, wonderful. If it's in a gathering where anyone and everyone can see, no, there's a problem with this. So we need to be careful. But again, I'm not digressing. I'm just trying to point out that the Mecca that Imam al-Sajjad lived in was hostile. But it wasn't hostile in the same way that our countries are hostile necessarily. It was a slightly different type of hostile, but hostility was there. At that time, Mecca was governed by the Zubairis. All of you, you must have heard of Talha and Zubair. Talha and uh, Zubair, who were companions of uh, Rasulullah and then Imam Ali, and they became companions with Lady Aisha in the Battle of the, of the Camel. They became, unfortunately, very confused. Of course, this was all instigated from behind by Muawiyah. But they became very confused and they got carried away. Now the son, Abdullah ibn Zubair, who is actually the same son of Zubair who killed Zubair. Zubair was killed just prior to the Battle of Jamal. He was killed after he started reflecting and realizing that going to war with Amir al-Mu'mineen was a mistake. And he wanted to leave the battlefield. He spoke to Talha. Talha was not happy about it. Abdullah ibn Zubair, the son of Zubair, he hurt his father. He realized what was going on. He realized that he would not be the Khalif, because this was his aspiration. He wanted the governance. He wanted the kursi, the power. And he actually turned around and killed his own father. He committed what is known as patricide, which is the crime of killing your own father. Anyway, through a whole load of different events and machinations and such, Abdullah ibn Zubair had taken power in Mecca and he had consolidated himself. He was well established in Mecca. And he was maintaining the peace. Another person in Mecca at the time who was actually related to Muhtar is Abdullah ibn Umar, uh, the, the son of Umar ibn Khattab, the second caliph of the Muslim community. And the, the, son, the, the son of uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab, Abdullah ibn Umar, was married to Mukhtar's elder sister. Now, I want you to think about this idea. We, within our Shia communities in the West, we are remarkably sectarian. We're getting better, alhamdulillah, but we have this sectarian trait going through us. Saying, oh, he's a Sunni, oh, he's a Shia, and we don't work together. In those times, this was not so much a problem like this. And we always reference back to those times as being when all of these problems came along and everything. No. Those people who worked against Abdul Bayt, they had no connection to Islam. People like Muawiyah, people like Yazid, all of these people, there is no Islam with them. They will use Islam just like today in our time. Muhammad bin Salman, oh, the person from the United, whatever it is, Emirates, or all of these places, these oil fields with flags and shopping malls with flags. There is no connection to Islam with these people. The same way Daesh, there was no connection with Islam. The same way that certain countries that profess Judaism or Christianity have no connection with these divine religions. So the government in Mecca at the time was Zubairi, but he was allowing people to do their thing. Remember these little, little points. Imam used to live in isolation. It wasn't like people could come and go and see the Imam easily. They could. Imam Sajjad could communicate with the people through dua. If we examine the book of Imam Sajjad, the famous work of Imam Sajjad, Sahifa Sajjadiyya, or Sahifa Kamila, we call it sometimes. This is a book that is probably one of the most authentic books of dua that we have. We have two reliable, very reliable chains of uh, which, narration for Sahifa. One which comes from Imam al-Baqir, and the other one which comes from Imam Zaid, who was the... Uh, who is the, the imam that the Zaydi brothers in Yemen follow. Give me a salawat, please. Now, Sahifa 
is a book which we look at on the surface and we think, MashaAllah, Imam Sajjad used to write wonderful du'as and all of this. And we don't really reflect on the du'as. But there are du'as there which teach lessons, portions within du'a, which actually say something. One of the du'a, for example, for good outcomes, is uh, it says one of, one of the, the stanzas in it is, Oh Allah, make me from your people because your people are successful. And make me from your, uh, your army because your army is victorious. And make me from your lovers because your lovers never fear anything, nor do they want for anything. Now, we might look at this superficially and think that's a very nice du'a, but it's also got a very strong political message to the population if you understand the climate and the environment. There are multiple meanings. Of course, we're not going to sit and discuss Sahih, for that would require many, many long sessions, but just to set the stage, if you like. So Imam Sajjad is in essentially what can be called house arrest, Arguably, according to some books, it wasn't formalized as a house arrest. But Abdullah ibn Zubair knew and he had animosity and hatred towards the family of Rasul anyway. So he kept them under observation for the most part. The same way that many, organized, many countries keep the Muslims under observation because they're not trusted. You know, they're kind of like, hmm, these Muslim people, they may actually obey the law, you know, because. Their religion tells them they have to abide by the law of the land, but you know they make stories anyway. So in that time, it was very, very difficult for Imam Sajjad himself to have meetings with anyone. And so Imam Sajjad had appointed, amongst other people, Muhammad bin Hanafiya to be his na'ib. Again, we come to the idea of the representative of the imam. And this is a representative of the imam while the imam is literally in the other room. So I want you to think about that. The representative of the imam has the authority of the imam. As far as you and me are concerned, the representative of the imam is essentially the imam as we have discussed in earlier sessions. Even if that imam the actual ma'asum imam is in the other room because we live in a specific time where our ma'asum imam is in ghayba. But being in ghayba doesn't mean he's not here. He could be here, he could be in each of your houses, he could be in all of our houses simultaneously. Right? He could be anywhere. And so when we are told to follow the instructions and to listen to the representative of the imam, Granted, we don't have a specific representative in the sense that, like Muhammad bin Hanafiya was explicitly named by Imam al-Sajjad as, okay, Muhammad bin Hanafiya, you are my representative. Or, for example, Muhammad bin Abi Bak was explicitly named by Amir al-Mu'mineen. No. But what we have is, any, we have a formula, as we've discussed earlier on, that tells us who the representative, general, non-specific, non-exclusive representative of the imam are. That is the righteous maraja and of course the wali al-faqih. So Mukhtar, he, okay, let's come back a little bit. Mukhtar, during the time of Imam al-Hassan, Mukhtar was after Imam Ali and after all of the fitna of Safin and all of these problems because Mukhtar was alive during these times. He was aware of it. His father was there. After all of that, he decided that there was too much confusion. It was too difficult. And he went to back to his original job or family business, if you like, which was as a farmer. They had a lot of land. They had land in parts of Iraq, they had land in Ta'if, they had land in many areas, and they used to farm crops. So he went and he worked in the farm, in his farm, with you know, many, many people. 
But he was also a well-known warrior. He was a well-known fighter, a well-known statesman, a well-known elite, if you like, in Kufa. And when initially it was heard, the information was delivered that Muawiyah has died, there was a, a meeting of all of the zu'ama, or the elders, or the ulama, if you like, the elders and ulama type of people of Kufa, heads of tribes and this type of thing. Everyone got together again at the house of Suleiman ibn Surad al Khazai, who we have mentioned before and we will mention again in a bit more detail. There was a meeting and Mukhtar was invited. All of the heads were invited, and the idea was that Suleiman and uh, Habib and a few other people had said, right, we need the Imam. Now that, now that Yazid has taken power, now that Muawiyah is dead, we need the Imam to come so that we can raise the flag of Tawheed properly and make sure that Islam is preserved and protected. The intention was good. So at this meeting, Mukhtar was also, of course, invited along with a few, maybe a few hundred heads of different tribes. And they wrote a letter. There was a letter that Suleiman ibn Surat had written and a few people had signed it. And they were talking, the discussion was, we have written this letter to Imam al Hussein. We want to send it to Imam al Hussein so to invite him to come over here. And so each tribe, the idea was that each tribe will stamp this, this first letter that will go to the Imam. And then within the tribes, they will speak to the elders within their individual tribes and they will send letters themselves, which is why Imam, ultimately from Kufa, he got, according to some riwayat, tens of thousands of letters. So in this session, and this is interesting, because this is a session that is not a bad session. They're planning or discussing something very good. But Mukhtar, when he comes, he sits quietly in the corner. He listens. And then when Suleiman, you know, the paper is going around so that people can put their stamp on it. In those times, they didn't sign like this or electronic signatures they had. Uh, something like a mohar. Normally, it was their ring, which had their seal on it. And they would put it in wax and they would sign it. And that's how the documents were signed in those days. So when it came to Mukhtar, Mukhtar quietly sort of apologized and left. So Suleiman is saying to Mukhtar that how come you're not signing? So I left my seal at home. So I want you to think about this and why this is important will become clear as we move on. Mukhtar wouldn't sign a document that would give the green light to the Imam to come. Now, ordinarily, when you look at this, you think there's something fishy about Mukhtar. Why doesn't he want the Imam to come? What's his problem? He's not really a follower of Shia. He's not a lover of Imam so He doesn't want the Imam to come. Was that the case? No. The reason was he was concerned. He knew the people of Kufa. And he knew they were... Uh, what's the word? They were emotional people, meaning, uh, I think in Urdu and even in Farsi and Arabic, the word is jazba, right? They will get very excited very quickly, act very rashly, and then when it comes to actually doing something, they'll become very weak and they haven't thought about it and you know they'll sort of wither away. He was worried about this. So this is a lesson for us that in any society, when there's any action that's going to be moving forward, that's quite a significant action. Before you commit yourself to it, think, understand, reflect. Don't just jump onto any bandwagon because everyone else is doing it. That's not to say that the activity might be wrong. I'm not saying that. I'm saying when you get involved in an activity, be sure about it. Understand the pros and cons. Understand the implications. Understand any potential consequences. Understand any sort of impact, positive or negative. So Mukhtar didn't sign the letter, which is very interesting. 
because Mukhtar was the head of the Thaqafi, Banu Thaqafi tribe in Kufa. And he didn't sign that letter to Imam Hussein that went, that resulted in Muslim bin Aqil coming. Does that mean Imam Mukhtar didn't want to do bay'ah? No, you'll be, it'll become a lot clearer as we move forward. So give me a salawat. So when these people all wrote this letter, they sent it. And then when Muslim came to Kufa to verify, because even Imam, like we've discussed, Imam said to Muslim that, look, all of these letters have come, but we need to make sure, you know, we need to verify whether their word and deed is together. It might be that someone's heart is with you, but their sword is against you. Someone might love you, might literally, you know, say, I'll die for you. But when it comes to the crunch time, give me, you know, when you say to them, give me your plate of food, say, oh, come on, look, I've got to eat, I'm hungry. They might love you, but they won't give you, they won't do something for you. So you need to be sure of the loyalty of people in that type of situation. So when Muslim came, where was the first place that Muslims stayed? Who was the one that was literally um, trembling to get to make sure Muslim is coming. As soon as Mukhtar found out that Imam Hussein has sent Muslim bin Aqil, they got information because they have, obviously, they have their own uh, people. They have friends. There are many um, traders going back and forth that give information that are friendly and provide information. So Mukhtar and his associates, they found out that Muslim bin Aqil is coming to Kufa. And they said, okay, the journey from, from yani Medina to Kufa, or Mecca to Kufa rather, shouldn't take you know, that long. It maybe take a month, for example. I can't remember the exact distance and time, but let's say it takes a month. More than a month has passed, but there's no sign of Muslim. So he sends two of his trusted people with some of their, uh, we call them Mawali, some of their... Militia, if you like. I don't like this word militia. It's become negative, but this is what they were. They worked for these people. They went into the desert to see because the desert between Hejaz and Iraq is very, very vicious. It's a very difficult desert to cross. And of course, in those days, there were no planes or cars or anything. People came on camels. People came on horses. And sadly, some people tried to come on foot, but many people died in the desert because it's not feasible. To, to come on foot all the time. Anyway, as they went into the desert, they pushed further into the desert, they see this single individual. His face is completely covered in sand. He's got cuts and bruises, and you can see he's been battered. You know, the, the elements have battered him. He sees them. They recognize him. One of the companions knew what Muslim looked like, and they, you know, Muslim passes out. They take Muslim, and where do they take him? They take him first to the house of Mukhtar. And Muslim stays in the house of Mukhtar for quite some time in the initial stages. And when he initially makes his announcement of, this is why I am here, this is before Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad has come, remember. Right now there's a power vacuum in, um, in Kufa. In fact, not really a vacuum. You've still got the Khalif, who was uh, the governor, rather, who was appointed by Muawiyah who is someone who was known as Nu'man. And Mukhtar was in a unique position. You see, Allah puts these people in unique positions in that Nu'man was the father-in-law of Mukhtar. Mukhtar had two wives. He had one wife who was um, not so good, not so mu'min. And the other one who he had married more recently, and she was the daughter of Nu'man who was the governor of uh, Muawiyah in Kufa, and he had not been replaced by Ubaidullah at this time. He was still continuing. The transition of power hadn't fully happened in terms of Yazid's rule. It was still very early days. So Mukhtar was, you know, he it was relatively straightforward for him to bring people into his house. The, the military, the police, they wouldn't give him too much of a 
hard time because he's the son-in-law, you know, at the end of the day. And also he was law-abiding. He didn't break the laws in that, uh, in that land. So Muslim was taken to Mukhtar's house. In Mukhtar's house, from the balcony, if you like, Muslim made his famous speech where he said that this is why I have come over here. It's on the back of all of these letters that you've sent me. Now I'm here to verify whether these letters were authentic, whether you are sincere, and are you going to actually uphold your uh, promise? And then the people, obviously, for the most part, people obviously tried to, you know, they came along and they gave him the hand and everything. But before all of these people, when Muslim was, after he had been sort of recovered a little bit, when they had put some, you know, medicine on his face to get rid of the sunburn and all of this stuff, the first person in Kufa to make bay'ah to Imam Hussein by way of Muslim bin Aqil was Muqtar. He was the first person. So now all of that happened. Now when Muslim was abandoned, the question must come in people's mind that, okay, we know Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, he came, he did this, he did this, but where was Muslim when, no, where was Mukhtar rather when Muslim was being thrown from the roof, when Hani was arrested and all of this stuff? What happened to Mukhtar, you know? So two things happened to Mukhtar. First of all, he was put, before Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad came, and when Muslim initially came along and said, we need to do this, we need to do this, Mukhtar and a few of his associates said that, okay, we can go. Because we have affinity to some of the tribes in the outskirts of Kufa, we, we can go and we can collect the bay'ah from them. So Muslim gave Mukhtar that permission, which he had from Imam Hussein, to act as the representative of the representative of an imam. So Mukhtar went to many of these tribes, spoke to them, and said, look, you know, Muslim bin Aqil, he has come, Imam Hussein is going to be coming over here. Are you ready to give bay'ah? And the people would then give bay'ah to Mukhtar, which would be equivalent to giving bay'ah to Muslim, which is equivalent to giving bay'ah to Imam Hussein. This particular type of chain we need to reflect on and think about with regard to our loyalty and our following of our marajah. When we tell, and this is a very, very important point, because otherwise we end up like the people of Kufa. And no one wants to end up like the people of Kufa. Even the people of Kufa don't want to end up like that. You know, many times when I mention this idea or other people mention this idea of the people of Kufa, some of my friends, you know, many of, I have some very good friends who are Iraqi and from Kufa. They become very sad. And I tell them, Habibi, look, people of Kufa are not necessarily from Kufa. They're from everywhere, all over the world. They could be sitting in Texas, they could be sitting in London, they could be sitting in anywhere, Leicester, wherever, in uh, Dublin, wherever, it doesn't matter. Hell, you could have people of Kufa sitting in a home. It doesn't, it's not a land, it's a mentality, it's a mindset. So Mukhtar and his companions were out. While they were out, Ubaidullah came, and what should never have happened, happened. Mukhtar was then, as he was coming back from these different tribes, which were quite far on the outskirts of Hufa, Najaf, and all of this area, because you have to understand, it wasn't, I mean, geographically and physically, yes, it was the same size, but getting around was significantly harder than it is today. Nowadays, if you go to Katabala, it's relatively easy to go to, or to Kufa, or to Najaf. It's maybe a few, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes between Kufa and Najaf or between Kufa and Karbala is maybe an hour, hour and a half, maybe two hours, depending on what the weather and traffic and everything. But in those days, it would take a long time because you had to take desert routes. And also you had to be careful because in those deserts there are wild, wild animals, there are, um, what are they called? They're, band, they're bandits, uh, highwaymen. This is something, you know. And you know, on that note, an interesting idea is that one of these oil fields with a flag, or sorry, shopping malls with a flag, that entire family, is a family that has ancestry in highwaymen, in people who are pirates. And now they are pirates who are stealing Palestine and getting nothing in return. But we'll leave that discussion for another time. Give me a salawat, please. 
So Mukhtar is outside. Mukhtar hears and he's told, as he's returning back to Kufa, he's told that there has been a, a disaster. Muslim bin Aqil has uh, been killed. And so the first question uh, Mukhtar asks is, what, what did Suleiman ibn Surah do? Suleiman ibn Surah is like the head of Kufa in terms of religious authority and all of this stuff. Self-appointed, but nevertheless, he was respected by everyone. Where's Suleiman? And this person who is informing him of the news says to him that, unfortunately, Suleiman abandoned Muslim. And Mukhtar is heartbroken by this because he understands what's going on. He understands the game. He understands, I mean, and he's told that, for example, when Hani was arrested, Muslim was in the house of Hani, and then Hani was arrested after Muslim escaped. Hani was tortured, and, you know, Banu Mizhaj, the tribe of Hani, a very strong tribe, very famous tribe, they were normally, Banu Mizhaj were a type of tribe that if you harm one hair on the head of any of their people, they will go to war with you. This is the Arab tribal type of system. They were very, this whole jazbat, this whole emotion, you know, you, you touch me, I will bury you type of thing. But this time, Hani, who was one of the senior people from Banu Mizhaj, he's arrested and he was beaten. But Banu Mizhaj were fooled because Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad had used someone who was a known judge, someone who was known by the name of Qazi Shuray. Qazi Shuray is someone from the time of Amir al-Mu'mineen. He was a judge. He was well known. He was trusted. But he had, um, he had weaknesses, shall we say. He used to like shiny things. And this became a very long-term problem for him and made him someone who is, who is now not as respected as he should be, shall we say. So Qazi Shuray was told by Ubaidullah to make the Mizhaj calm them down. Mukhtar has been given all of this information. And Mukhtar is frustrated because he's saying, and the people, these Mizhajiin, they accepted it. All they had to do is ask to see Hani. And that's what the Mizhaj people were asking, that we want to see Hani. And Ubaidullah said, well, you can't see him right now, but Qazi Shuray has seen him. Will you accept Qazi Shuray's verdict? And so, you know, some of these people, they say, oh, Qazi Shuray, mashallah, of course, yes, no problem. Whereas they should have said, well, yeah, okay, fine, wonderful. Qazi Shuray has seen him. If he can see him, we can go and see him. Why is it what, you know, he's got some sort of, you know, corona type thing and you've got no, you know, protective equipment that we can't go and see, honey? No. But the Mizhajin, unfortunately, accepted things blindly. And this is another important lesson. The Mizhajin were a famous tribe, like I said. One of their seniors, one of their seniors is arrested, is beaten, is dragged from his house, is ha has many allegations made against him and is disappeared inside the palace of Kufa. They have gathered outside the palace of Kufa with their swords and they're saying, we're not going to budge until, the, until we see Hani. And all it takes to pacify them, all it takes is one Qazi Shuray saying, oh, Ms. Hajin, I've seen him, he's fine, move along. Halas. And not one of the person from the Ms. Hajin is stepping up and saying, look, Qazi Shuray, we love you. You've seen him. We want to see him. We want representatives from our tribes to go and see him. But anyway, what never should have happened, happened. As Mukhtar is being given this information, he's progressively, of course, getting more and more upset. And he says, okay, fine. So he goes back into Kufa to see if there's anything that can be salvaged, if there's anything that can be done. And to find out, because remember, no one really knew where Imam Hussein was. Didn't, you know, there was, like I said yesterday, there was no GPS. People knew roughly which direction Imam Hussein is going in, but they didn't know. And one of the things Mukhtar wanted to make sure happened is that Imam Hussein did not come to Kufa, which is why he rushed back inside Kufa and he sent some of his most trusted people towards Karbala. 
and uh, or towards like basically towards the desert to try and find Imam Hussein. We say towards Karbala because you know that's where it happened. But actually, like I say, they didn't know where, so they went towards like the last known trajectory. He was coming from Mecca, so he would be here. He's traveled for X days with a caravan, so they'll be traveling a little bit slower. So maybe they'll be around here somewhere. And in the meantime, he came inside. Now, when this is where it gets interesting. When Mukhtar came back, the night that everyone was going to be setting off for this, for Karbala, or just a few days, few nights before, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad understood that this is a problem. We have to make sure that we get rid of Mukhtar because he's going to be a liability to us. And this is also a very important lesson that the enemy knows who is problematic and who is not problematic. The enemy does not mind how much you pray. The enemy will buy you a musalla and a sajada. They will get you the best torbat from Karbala. The enemy has no problem with this. They will get you a sabha that is made of pearls. They will give you a Quran that is engraved in gold. The enemy has no problem with you doing this, only this, this work in terms of keeping it yani, to yourself. Where the enemy has a problem is when the enemy knows that you can see through the lies of the enemy. That, and not only can you see through the eyes, because there's several types of people. If you're someone who can see through the lies of the enemy, but you do nothing about it, you don't have the backbone or the courage or the ability or the wherewithal to even speak out, even write against this oppression, then there's a problem over here. And there is a type of person who can't see through the enemy's lies and they just accept blindly whatever the enemy is saying. Now, when I say enemy over here, some people may be thinking I'm talking specifically about Yazid or specifically about Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad or specifically about Shemar or Amar ibn Sa'ad or one of these people. I'm not. These are lessons. The same way Quran gives us lessons about, for example, Nabi Musa, Bani Israel and the golden calf. Uh, about Nabi Lut and the people of his uh, city, about Nabi Saleh, about Nabi Hud, and many lessons within Prophet's own time about, for example, Hijrah and what happened during Hijrah and everything. There's a reason why Allah doesn't give us detail because the lesson is, while the lesson is being framed and given in the context of this happened in this, you know, to this Prophet. It's being told to you as a story, as a story you would tell a young child or a baby. But actually, what you should be pulling out of that is the lesson. If you don't receive the lesson from it, then you have really wasted your time. Because the lesson is by far the most important thing. Why am I telling you all of this stuff about different types of people and thinking? Because... We, in our society, across the world, we have these same types of people and more. We have people who know there is a problem. And I'm talking at multiple layers. I'm talking within a family structure. I'm talking within a community. I'm talking within a city, talking within a country, and I'm talking globally why, at the wider level. There are people who know there is a problem, but they can't quite put their finger on it. But they know something's wrong. There are people who have no clue. So I think everything is absolutely fine. No issues, no problem. And you have other people who know there is a problem. They understand what the problem is, but they still do nothing because they feel that, Ya Allah, what can I do? I am one person. Ya Allah, please forgive me. I will sit and recite dua. Dua has its importance. I'm not diminishing the role of anyone here. And then you have other people who, while they can't do too much, at the very least, at the very least, on something like even Twitter, something meaningless like Twitter, 
they at least speak truth to power, as the saying goes. Mukhtar's question regarding all of these people that were in Kufa, because all of these different qualities of people existed in Kufa during the time when Muslim bin Aqil was being killed. Why was there no one there who was ready to speak truth to power except Muslim bin Aqil and Hani ibn Arwa, who were there physically and who gave everything for that? So on that note, um, I think we'll have to move to the musibah because time is really catching up with us. I think for the remaining sessions, we will be covering the, the, the subject of Mukhtar. Uh, I didn't actually want to do it for this long, but I think there's so many lessons in it um, that I think it's necessary for us to cover it because it's a story that many people, maybe many people don't know and many people who do know it maybe haven't looked at it in the way that we're trying to look at it. So before we shift to the musibah, the lessons that we've achieved from, or at least tried to get from today's session, is that the na'ib, the representative of the imam, is essentially the imam to all intents and purposes. This idea some people come out with that, oh, but he's not ma'asum, is noise. Yes, he is not ma'asum, but in all, for all intents and purposes, for that particular subject area, for that particular purpose, he is. Halas. Some people may not like this. I can't do anything about that. This is the reality. This is not Shabir saying it. This is people far more senior than me who are saying this and who have said this. The second thing we learned is the different types of people. Third thing is that when a situation arises in your communities, in your families, amongst your friends, even personally for you, it's always better not to act on it emotionally. Think it through. Never be rash. Because when you're rash and you're quick at acting on something, you haven't thought through the entire situation. You haven't weighed up the pros and the cons. And when sometimes people act rashly, you end up with a situation where you end up doing more harm than good. Not deliberately. You're not doing this deliberately. But because you haven't thought it through, you end up being those people that we've mentioned in Quran, in Surah Al-Kahf, that Allah is saying to us, قُلْ هَلْ نُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِالْأَخْسَرِينَ عَمَالًا Allah doesn't say these people are really, really evil, bad people. No, he says those people who are the greatest losers. It's a statement of pity, of sadness, that someone who genuinely, maybe their heart was in the right place, but because they didn't think a, an activity through, they didn't think everything through properly, they didn't understand, they didn't reflect before acting, they became from those people their efforts. All of their efforts are misguided. And all the time, while their efforts are misguided, the tragedy, and this is a real tragedy, is that they think. They think that they are doing, they assume they're doing something good. So give me a salawat and we will move to the musibah, inshallah. Sallallahu alayka ya Sayyidi ya Aba Abdullah. Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Wa ala al arwahi allati hallat bi finaik. Alaykum minna jami an salamullahi abadam ma baqeet. Wa baqi al laylu wa nahar. ولا جعل الله آخر الأهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين My dear brothers and sisters, I want you to close your eyes and take yourselves to Karbala. Close your eyes and imagine the wilderness of Karbala. 
Imagine that you're a bird flying over Karbala. It is the day of Ashura. It is the night of Ashura. And the camps are there. You have the camp of Yazid. And you see this small camp, which is the camp of Hussein. And you can see that it's the camp of Hussein because you can hear the children asking for water. You see a tent. You see a tent and you see people congregated around it. And you see this man filled with light speaking to his small number of companions. And this is Imam al Hussein. And this is the night of Ashura. And Imam Hussein is saying to the people that, Oh, my companions, oh, my beloved companions, I remove my allegiance from you. I remove you. I relieve you of my bay'ah. If you want to leave, then you can leave. The enemy is only interested in me. They have no squabble with you. So you can leave. I will turn the candles off and you can leave by night so no one knows that you have left. As Imam is saying this, as Imam is saying this, a voice can be heard. And first of all, we have Abul Fadl al Abbas. He says, O oh, our Imam, if they take us and they kill us and they cut us into a thousand pieces and then they bring us back together and they burn us and they burn us again, and they do this a thousand, tens of thousands of times, we will never abandon you, O Hussein. You then hear Habib saying the same thing. You hear Zuhair saying the same thing. You see Habib ibn Mawahir saying the same thing. And you see two young men, you see two young men, who go to Sayyidah Zainab and they're close to Sayyidah Zainab and they're looking at her and she nods to them and she says, my sons, inshallah, you also have to participate. They breathe a sigh of relief because they say that we want to participate, but we didn't know if you will give us permission. She said that how is it that if I don't let you, but the sons of Hussein go, what face will I have to show my brother? Ajrukum ala Allah. So now we move to the day of Ashura. And to the day of Ashura, the day of what we call Qiyamat al sughra You have these two young men, these two young men. They are the sons of Abdullah ibn Ja'far al-Tayyar, the husband of Sayyid Zainab. They are the life and joy of Sayyid Zainab. Imagine any of you who are mothers over here, imagine you have two young, beautiful sons. They are not even old enough to be married or not old enough to go, you know, to be adults. They're still young. Imagine these two sons who want to go out onto the battlefield. Imagine the pain you will have, especially when you have no choice, when you know that this is something that is necessary. Ajrukum ala Allah. The boys come to Sayyidah Zainab. She helps them dress in the armor and the, the clothes of battle. She gives them the sword from her father, from their father, and says, Ya, O oh my sons, please, I beg you to give salams to Rasulullah and to my father Ali and to Fatima al-Zahra. And my sons, I am honored that you are giving this pathway, you are going on this pathway. Aun and Muhammad, the two sons of Said Zainab, they go out to the battlefield after Imam Hussein grants them permission very reluctantly. According to some riwayat, when they went to Imam al Hussein, Imam Hussein would say, Go to Said Zainab. Said Zainab would say, Go to Imam Hussein. In the end, they went to Abul Fadl al Abbas, and Abbas went to Imam Hussein with them. This is, there are some, there, there are many maqatil, and this is one of the ones that I have read. So they went to the battlefield, and these two sons are from Banu Hashim. They are a famous tribe. They are a tribe that is known to be strong warriors. They come out on the battlefield, but they're only very young. They're only very young. And remember, these boys, these two boys, they haven't had water for three days as well. And they're youngsters, they're youth, they're children. Not children, but youth. 
They go out on the battlefield and even in the condition they are, they fight valiantly, they fight hard, they fight strongly, they fight firmly, they fight together back to back. They cover the enemy all around them. But the enemy, Shemar, he has no mercy even on such children. When he initially sees them, he doesn't recognize who they are. He says, who are these two people? They're fighting like veterans. They're fighting like very, very strong veterans. Someone tells him they're the sons of Abdullah ibn Ja'far al-Tayyar. They're the sons of Sayyid Zainab. And he says, you have to deal with this. These are Hashimiyin. These people, you cannot defeat them in the battlefield. You have to play unfair. You have to surround them and batter them by multiple people. If you keep fighting them one by one, they will wipe out everyone. So ultimately, these two boys, they were killed brutally in the battlefield. And as they're going, as they're going, they cry out, Assalamu alaykum ya Aba Abdullah. And Imam Hussein rushes with Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. He rushes to them. They get to the battlefield. They get the two boys. And before they can get there, these two boys have already returned to Rasulullah. Imam Hussein and Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas carry these two bodies to the camp of, to the, camp of the, the Sabaya, the people, to the camp of Imam Hussein. And they don't know how to face said Zainab. They place the two bodies near her. And said Zainab, you would expect someone like said Zainab, a mother who has just seen her two boys, the two apples of her eye, seen them have their life cut short by the worst of people. You would expect her to start wailing and crying and being hugely mournful. But this is Islam. What does said Zainab do? Said Zainab turns around looks towards the Qibla, goes into sujood, and she says, Rabbana taqabbal minna hadha al-qurban. Oh Allah, please accept from us this sacrifice. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raja'oon. Ridham bi qadaihi wa tasliman li amrih. Ya Allah, we ask you to accept our small ibadat, our small azah. Ya Allah, we ask you to give us the same tawfiq as you gave to the shuhada of Karbala. To, to the same tawfiq you gave to people like Muqtar to discern truth from falsehood and give us that wisdom and insight that we can always be faithful and true to Islam. Ya Allah, we ask you to protect Islam and Muslimin. Ya Allah, we ask you to protect the Mu'mineen. Ya Allah, we ask you to protect and release all of those righteous ulama and righteous people who are illegally incarcerated like Sheikh Ali Salman or Sheikh Ibrahim Zakzaki. Ya Allah, we ask you to protect Islam. We ask you to protect the Muslims. We ask you to destroy Taghut. We ask you to destroy Nifaq. We ask you to destroy those, pe- those entities that are satanic, that work for shaitan, that operate in his, in his pleasure. Ya Allah, we ask you to protect all of the righteous believers, all of the righteous ulama, all of the righteous maraja, and especially the leader, Imam Khamenei. And above all, Ya Allah, Please protect and hasten the return of Imam al hajjah Jalla Ta'ala, Farajahu Sharif, and count us among those people who are from his true companions. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.